I, yes, I guess we are live now. Welcome back at the session or welcome when, uh, for the first time at this um, AI track. Uh, we have a whole morning in ICT on, in practice uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, so we had a previous session which was a bit generic and a bit strategic. We have a second session which is titled AI for people and for planets. We have two guest speakers for that and we have uh, Martin Hunderpol from uh, Atos joining the session. Uh, but I also have two researchers from my group, Petra and Michiel. And I propose to do a quick introduction round first and maybe we can start with our guests. Uh, so Manon, can I uh, give you uh, the microphone and can you say who you are, what you are doing? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Anon Peters. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, Institute for Allied Health Professionals. Um, and I'm working in uh, close collaboration with uh, the faculty of uh, ICT, with Gerard. And I'm doing research uh, uh, in the field of uh, wearables and stress measurements to support healthcare. Thanks. Uh, Talia, can you say something? Who you are and what you are doing and how we are connected. Um, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Talia. I'm one of the students from uh, one of the minors, so the ADS minor. And uh, me and my group, we work together with uh, Gerard Scout, Scout on one of his projects we will be talking about today. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Talia. Uh, Martin, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Gerard. Martin Hunderpol of uh, ETHOS, uh, manager of the Atos Technology Lab, and um, yeah, participating also uh, with colleagues in the Fontes ICT Innovation Lab, where we do several projects with students. Sometimes I have the privilege to uh, uh, supervise them myself, uh, not always, but uh, uh, and also <coughs> chairman of uh, Spark Corporation, uh, uh, which is the corporation where you can uh, apply for membership uh, for participating in the Fontes ICT Innovation Lab. And I'm also a member of the Strategic Advisory Board of Fontes ICT. Yeah, we will come back to that in the discussion and we will talk a little bit about Spark and what it can mean and how it can help Fontes in our ambitions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we will continue the introduction round with uh, Petra. Yeah. My name is Petra Heck uh, and I'm a lecturer in software engineering and researcher in AI engineering uh, at Fontes ICT, also connected to the lectorate uh, AI and Big Data of uh, Gerard. Um, and I will also be hosting uh, the third session today uh, at 11.15 on uh, production-ready machine learning systems. Okay, and on my left hand is Michiel. Yeah. Um, I'm also a researcher in the lectorate AI and uh, Big Data. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, today I will be mostly uh, monitoring the chat. So if there's any questions, um, please ask them and I will try to get them uh, into the uh, discussion. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so then uh, I propose to continue with uh, this uh, session. Um, uh, this session is really dedicated and we give you some insight in some real projects that are going on. And for the first project, I want to give the floor to Manon. Thank you. I'll share my presentation. Is it visible? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'll, we will. We will make it just a little bit larger. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for that. <laughs> I can't see my, uh, my slides. Okay. Yes, everybody can see the slides um, fine. Yes. Um, yeah, like I said, I'm a Peters, postdoctoral researcher, and I'm studying the use um, of wearable sensors uh, in healthcare. Uh, and today I'm just going to give you a quick overview about um, regarding what we are doing. And nowadays there are a lot of wearables uh, available, like you saw on my first slide, and those wearables are capable of measuring stress-related parameters uh, pretty well. So they measure movement, skin temperature, um, heart rate um, or heart activity, skin conductance, and those are all parameters which tell us uh, something about the stress level a person is experiencing. Um, an example of that is, for example, <laughs> it's uh, always a nice experiment, 
you put uh, someone into a VR, uh, virtual reality environment. Um, and uh, I don't know if, if people know this game. Um, it's a height experience and it looks fake, but it feels really real. If you're in it, then you, you feel your body reacting to it. And it's, um, yeah, it's like you're really there. Um, and you also see the body reacting. So if you measure that with, uh, for example, a wearable, uh, yeah, you can see the body reacting. So the, the line here, the, if you see my mouse, but the, the vertical line um, is depicting the, the point where the, the person is uh, on the plank really high and you see the, the skin conducting, uh, yeah, skin conductance increasing. Um, so you can imagine that these kinds of uh, technologies can support healthcare because if we can uh, gain insights into the stress of others, for example, people who cannot communicate themselves uh, uh, anymore, uh, like in dementia or uh, autism or other groups who cannot communicate, um, and then we can um, yeah, help them better, provide better care for them if you can measure the stress objectively. Um, and another uh, way to support healthcare is when you can gain insight in your own stress. So think uh, of uh, yeah, burnout prevention or people with aggression problems, uh, biofeedback in uh, anxiety disorders, etc. So there are a lot of um, yeah, ways to um, apply this type of technology in healthcare. But when we are going to do that, um, applying these wearables in healthcare, we have a lot of stakeholders uh, with a lot of questions and a lot of different questions. So I, I just collected a few uh, here on this slide. But you, know, you have to think about which sensor do I use, which hardware, but also which software, how should I read out the data, which algorithms should I use, when, when do we um, talk about stress, when is it stress, and when is it just a small increase yeah, in, in heart rate. Um, but also uh, in the healthcare process, how, how does it fit in, in the working processes um, of people uh, and companies and institutions? Uh, is it cost efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, so this is one of uh, uh, the things where we are really, um, yeah, we are busy with in our research to answer those types of, of questions. Um, what I want to show you is the added value of AI um, because one of the important questions is which algorithm should we use and should we use AI and why should we use AI? Um, just to give you a quick idea, um, if we use an algorithm which uh, is rule-based, a one-size-fits-all algorith algorithm, so we say, okay, if the skin conductance um, is increasing in X percentage and it's for everybody the same, we know that we can predict um, or, or we can detect um, uh, slightly over 50% of the stress. If we um, do it still rule-based, but we change the rules per person, and we do that over several iterations, we can already predict 70% um, of the stress correct. Um, so that's already, uh, um, you see what is to gain if you make the, the algorithm personal. And if you go one step further and really use machine learning, we know that we can uh, go up to, uh, here's 82%, but I also read articles which go to 90, 95%, uh, depending on the exact model and situation. Um, so also AI plays a really important role in, in stress, accurate stress detection. Um, yeah, although we know a lot already and there is a lot of technology available already, um, we have still a lot of uh, challenges, uh, challenges to solve. Um, so currently um, we are focusing on, for example, these are just some examples, um, uh, which legal and ethical considerations play a role and how do they fit into this uh, technology. Um, which sensor, which hardware should we choose? Not every sensor is suitable for every uh, context. Um, for example, people with dementia tend to uh, throw off the wearables. So you have to think about the design of the wearable so that it's accepted in that, that patient group. Um, but also people, for example, who move a lot, um, yeah, if, if you measure a heart activity with a PPG sensor, a, a wristband, uh, that's also more prone to artifacts, so you might uh, rather use a uh, um, chest band, etc. So for every context and every patient group or target group, uh, there are different considerations. Um, 
Yeah, you need all, if you are going to use AI, you need also to think about uh, the collection of clean and structured data, um, which in healthcare um, yeah, might be a problem sometimes. Uh, and also the software which is used, the user interface should really be adapted to the context because um, yeah, a healthy young person has different needs than um, the, the caretaker for somebody uh, or the caregiver for somebody with dementia. Mm -hmm. um, so the um, uh, user interface should be adapted to the context. Um, so that's, um, yeah, in gross lines, the things we are, um, we are busy with. There are a lot of people involved um, in this research. And uh, if you have any questions or remarks or you want to collaborate, or you can always contact me. Okay, uh, thanks Manon um, for this clear presentation. Um, I just want to ask everybody, uh, are there some quick questions about this presentation? Okay, yeah, I, I have one. <laughs> uh, so we also had a student, um, oh no, actually I have two. The first question is, uh, there are also big companies like Garmin and Fitbit uh, who provide wearables and have very nice dashboards and user interfaces and apps, etc. Mm -hmm. Why do we need this uh, project? What, what makes our project unique? Can you say a few words about that? Uh, yes, yes, Garmin and Apple and Fitbit are making great stuff, um, but they are not meant for healthcare. Um, and the problem with that is they um, you have a dip different type of uh, legislation they fall under. So um, if you look at the GDPR, um, but also other uh, medical device regulations, um, they are not always allowed in the healthcare process. And the second thing is because they are designed for a different group of people, uh, mostly the group of people who are very young and fit and want to get insight into their own health status. Um, yeah, also the software and the dashboards are are designed differently than what is needed in healthcare. Yeah, so, so we have kind of uh, complex clinical situations and you want specialized uh, solutions for that. Yeah, dedicated solutions which really fit in the work process uh, of a healthcare institution. And that also that, that is different for people with dementia uh, or people with autism. Uh, because the degree they have insight into the selves uh, yeah, is different, uh, the caregivers are different, so you have all the types of different situations. Um, and the software should be fine-tuned uh, to that. Yeah. Okay, that, that was one question. And the second question is, so we had a, a graduate student working last year, uh, and he was able to collect the data on an uh, Azure platform to get it streaming. Yeah. What are the plans for continuation? Um, let's say the immediate plans, we have some long-term future plans, but uh, can you say a few words about that? Yeah, the immediate plans is uh, yeah, to get some uh, funding and to build a consortium to make this project um, not only bigger, but also for the valorization part, so we can really help healthcare. We can really develop um, things which are going to, market, going to the market. Uh, that's an important one. Um, and indeed, we also always involve uh, student projects in this project um, yeah, because we think that's important to do because that's our societal role, but also because the students really have to add something uh, when it comes to think about data architectures or doing like um, basic testing of prototypes. Um, so we already have a number of uh, prototypes uh, which are not like not uh, fit to go to the market, but which also like our fundamental uh, ground idea about how it could be developed further. Okay, thanks Manon for these uh, uh, quick answers and we come back to this in the uh, overall discussion. I now want to give the floor to Talia for uh, the minor case on flower power. Uh, Talia, please go ahead. Uh, let me see if I can... Uh, do you see it? Yes, yes we see it. Okay, it's showing, okay. We'll make it a little bit larger. <laughs> no worries. So hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, me and my project group for the minor were working on uh, together with Gerard. Um, 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about our problem, the goals, and a little bit what we did, and mostly focus on the results that we got. So first, let me talk about the problem that we actually wanted to tackle. So as you can see from this infographic, uh, it talks a little bit about um, of the, the pollinators. Why am I talking about pollinators when this is about flowers? Well, the idea here to monitor um, wildflowers comes because they, they serve as a kind of like ind indirect indicator to bigger problems. So for example, here we see that crops and wildflowers in just in the European Union are dependent on insects for pollination and they also have a huge economical impact. We see about 15 billion euros. So we also see why pollinators are vital <coughs> and what is causing their decline. So by using something like monitoring uh, biodiversity of flowers, for example, we can determine potentially other bigger problems that might be going on. So if there are reduced biodiversity or reduced number of flowers in specific regions, maybe there are other issues like pollution or pollinators that are uh, declining due to other bigger issues. So it is a good indicator of, uh, of other issues ongoing in the ecosystem. So what was the goal of the actual of the project? So the goal of the project overall is to accurately recognize and count these wildflowers, um, but also to reduce the cost and this time and the time spent on manual observations and this kind of research. The more specific goal that our project group had was to kind of um, start the base research to to investigate techniques and to research more and see what were viable uh, ways to tackle this issue so this is a bit of an overview of the data set that we worked with so there were over 120 images that we were given as part of the data set and there are a total of 41 species here you only see a um, kind of a sample of those species not all of them are here and these are the species that have a count above 100 uh, so we see that, for example, daisies are very prevalent. And this is just, just to give an overview. We had uh, uh, over 10,000 individuals uh, counted in this data set. Um, so we were provided these images and also an observations file. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about what the approach that we took in relation to this project. So in the first, we took a kind of iterative kind of approach. So in the first iteration, we did some data cleaning, mostly from uh, minor stuff. We also had to do some labeling because we had an observations file, um, but there was no labeling in the actual pictures that we were provided. And we experimented a bit to try to get object detection uh, working. In the second iteration, because we had to go, we had some issues and we had to go back to the drawing board, we decided to take a different approach. So we used a image processing approach to kind of segment the images and get those little flowers from the image. We then with these little cropped out flowers managed to do some labeling. And we did our first machine learning experiments here. Um, after our first experiments, we realized that we needed to do some data augmentations. As you saw in the previous slide, there was a bit of an imbalance in the number of individuals for each species. So basically, we had to explore some techniques uh, with augmenting uh, some minority classes, reducing some others that had too many individuals. And we ended up with, in total, out of the 41 species, we ended up working with a sample of 11 species to see if things were working. Um, with this data, we then worked on with some pre-trained models and we also made our own small convolutional neural network um, to see how it would perform. So I'm first going to talk about the pre-trained models that we worked with. Um, so these are the four models that you can see here on the um, on, on one side. So we worked with ResNet50, VGG16, Inception V3 and MobileNet V2. As you can see, the accuracies are on the somewhat lower end, but we can also see that, for example, Inception v3 performed much better than the others, while VGG16 had a bit of a smaller performance. But this doesn't say, give the whole picture. So as an example here, we see for ResNet50, we have like the training and validation accuracy as well as the loss. But we also have a very key component here in terms of visualization, which is a confusion matrix. Um, so in this confusion matrix, we could see how well a model is performing in terms of classification. Ideally, you want the diagonal of this matrix to be around one, and everything outside of that diagonal is basically misclassifications happening. So we see that even though the accuracies might not have been very high, but we see that there is some classification going on uh, even here, but maybe not the best performance. 
Uh, here we can see very well why VGG16 had the accuracy that it had of 17%. I think it's very self-explanatory uh, about it. Uh, here was the best one that we got in terms of the pre-trained models. We can also see that there are more values in the in the diagonal than in the other um, in the other squares. And finally, for mobile net v2, it's very similar to VGG16 in terms of results. Um, so then we also made our own small little network. Um, and for this network, we investigated three um, basically activation functions. Um, for the input layers and hidden layers, I will not go into a lot of uh, technical details, but these were just three uh, possible different functions. They are somewhat similar, but uh, yeah, just to see how well they would perform. We can see that the accuracies all look very high, so of course we need other visualizations to really determine if it's working. So we see with the first one that it seems to be working very, very well. So we see most of the values sit in the diagonal and there is very little misclassification going on and the model seems to be learning somewhat. Um, with the second activation function, we see that it's not so much the case. So this could be that this is just not a very suitable function for this case. And the last one has a very similar performance to the, to the first one that I showed, where it does seem to perform very, very well. And there's very little misclassification going on. So we also had some recommendations at the end of our project um, to, to, for the future of the project. So we were working with images that have a very high resolution, but the quality itself of the image was not the best. Um, so that could be something that could be improved in the future. Um, it would be nice in the future for the future of the project to work with the images already pre-labeled by professionals um, to avoid human error because <clears throat> us as students we learned how to do it together with Gerard and uh, but uh, of course a professional that does it will always be better uh, would be nice to go back to object detection um, because we think this could bring a lot of good results uh, we were not able due to time constraints to really go in depth with it also the data augmentation algorithms that we used um, do introduce are known to introduce some bias um, because a lot of it consists of things like rotating the images and flipping them, which can introduce quite a bit of bias. So it would be interesting to look into other kinds of augmentation algorithms that might be better suited and have not so much of a huge uh, tendency to produce bias. Uh, lastly, one of the last points was to investigate the results further. As you saw, the results were seemed quite nice, so with a very high accuracy, but the models themselves started at a very high accuracy as well. So this should be investigated to make sure that everything is okay. And for the rest, uh, the last point will be about the pre-trained models. This is because we worked with frozen models. Um, and of course, we expected the performance to be not very high, but we still saw that some of them had a nice, uh, um, had still had a good accuracy of, for example, v, uh, Inception V2 had 46%. And so if we now pick these models and we investigate further by unfreezing some of the layers and retraining them with our data, it could be that we discover some very good results and some very nice uh, way forward for the project. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody understood. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yeah, there's one uh, question in the chat uh, from Mario, and he says, uh, would you say that your model was overfitting? Um, we don't think that the model is, well, not from, the, not from our graphs, we don't think it's overfitting, but we think there is, there is potentially a, a large bias, because basically over, I think, 80% of the, data, the sample data set uh, ended up being augmented, uh, part of was consisted of augmented images, so there could be that it's uh, that there's a little there's a big bias here, but we don't think that at the moment we can really conclude that it's overfitting. Okay, thank you. And and I think a question for Gerard. Uh, Carline asks, uh, was the data set uh, created uh, uh, by uh, uh, hand counted flowers? No, um, I was very much involved in the data collection here. Uh, we used drones and we fly above uh, fields with flowers and we captured uh, images from a drone uh, at various heights and these were the images that were given to the students. Uh, and uh, we also marked a patch on the ground of several square meters, 
a few square meters. And for each square meter, we manually counted the flowers that were present in this specific square meter. So the students were given uh, the Excel sheet with the uh, manually counted flowers. So that there must be on this square meter, there must be 125 daisy flowers, there must be 20 but buttercups, and they were given the images. Uh, but what we did in the minor, and I helped the students with that, was also labeling directly the images itself. So taking into account these manual counts on the Excel sheet, and then drawing boxes around the flowers in the images and checking every, whether we could found every flower back. It could not be traced uh, back for 100%, but we did a pretty good job there. But it was uh, manually, the, the labeling. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I also want to thank Talia, uh, Talia for her presentation. I think uh, it gives also a good uh, uh, view on what we do with our students, good insight in what our students can do uh, in, in the area of de deep learning. Uh, so I was really happy with this case and that we have now some first models. We could definitely improve on that. Uh, so tell, uh, tell ya, thanks for your presentation and also for uh, the minor case, doing the minor case. Um, what I do, what, what I want to do in the, I see that it took a little bit more time than we thought. I, what I want to do is give the word to uh, Martin and uh, maybe you can say a little bit about these, what, what are your thoughts when you hear these cases and how could Spark be involved in this or maybe it's interesting for Atos, etc. So okay. maybe you can reflect on that a little bit. Yes, well, to start, uh, I enjoyed your presentation very much, Manon and Natalia. Um, I think it's for both Spark and Atos, but for everybody, very uh, very useful, very interesting. Um, I especially liked um, what Manon addressed about uh, uh, different uh, groups. If you have elderly people with caretakers, whether you have children with caretakers, when AI... Uh, it will be a part of the caretaking, then um, it should be able to uh, <clears throat> to see the difference in the way of thinking. Huh? Because I think uh, both elderly as uh, or elderly and children are different society society or groups, which demand something of the <clears throat> ability of AI, uh, how it can be uh, useful. Um, well, regarding uh, also the the flowers. Uh, yeah, I think it's also very, very interesting. Um, reminds me of a project which we have done um, in the innovation lab with uh, the Biome company about, uh, we established a database of nanostructures. Um, over 200,000 uh, nanostructures uh, <coughs> are available in databases. And how can you apply them? Eh? Whether you're gonna use uh, paint for a car or uh, developing buildings, um, how can it, <coughs> help uh, our society if you know more about the um, about the nanostructures and how you can use them and apply them, whatever its purpose may uh, may be. Um, well, when you look at the SPARC, um, yes, we're the corporation. The abbreviation stands for <coughs> Shared Platform for Applied Researchers. Uh, we do different projects within the Fontes ICT Innovation Lab. Um, the projects I men I've mentioned earlier with the nanostructures, we've done that with the data-driven business uh, lab. Very interesting. Unfortunately, we did we were not uh, we've not been able to reach the stadium of AI, but we can <clears throat> continue with this project um, by deep learning, and then the next step might be AI. So I look forward to a further project. Um, and I also see similarities to uh, maybe an interesting upcoming project about the data-driven biodiversity management as service for cities. So I hope we can launch that uh, project soon. Um, yeah, um, it's good to know we, that- We are, by the way, very happy that Spark uh, is willing to also invest in this project and support and fully supports it. And maybe we can have a later discussion because I'm now in the process with Manon yep. for applying for a uh, funding uh, for this uh, wearable project, and we have some ideas for that, but I certainly want to come back to you uh, and discuss yep. this also further. Yep. Yep. Uh, from your side, do, do you, uh, or maybe um, just a general question for us all, uh, 
Are there any ideas? So we, we have seen the topics a little bit about deep learning and biodiversity. We see have seen the topic of uh, health and AI. Um, are there any ideas where, where we say, okay, this is maybe a good idea to pick up or uh, or are there companies in the chat that uh, are saying, okay, I'm inspired by this and I want to join you? Or if I have other ideas, please uh, mention this, then we can reach out to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> or or may, maybe there, there's uh, uh, maybe there's existing projects we can or connect existing to. Project we can, yeah, of course. That, would, that yeah. would be awesome. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, I want to thank you all for this uh, interesting session and to give some uh, in-depth insights into these uh, AI projects. And I think it's time already to close. No, 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 no. Okay, we have still <laughs> 10 minutes. There, there is some time still for, uh, for oh. some questions from the audience. So if there's any questions, please don't hesitate oh, sorry. To, to ask. <laughs> no, no, Gerard, it's not time I've, yet. I've questions enough. No worries. So, uh, no worries, yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm interested in, um, so I've also a lot of discussions within the Brainport region, and we have basically, uh, the Brainport region is working on three AI topics, three AI related topics, and that is smart mobility, smart industry, and uh, health tech, so the technical side of healthcare. Uh, they, these are really the focus points, and we want to differentiate uh, nationally with these three uh, main points, but we are also discussing within Brainport, also inspired by these examples, to build up an AI for good program together with Tilburg University and to apply for a ELSA lab for this, which is a lab about, uh, let's say, uh, societal acceptance of AI because Brainport also wants to uh, connect to that. And on the other side, I also see some data science or AI companies that are joining forces. For instance, there is an initiative within Eindhoven of CUX, PIPL, uh, Greenhouse Group, uh, CQM, all, uh, let's say, very good uh, data science companies that are joining their efforts and saying, okay, we want to make a cooperation, they call it Bits for Help, uh, to also work on this. So my question is, is this something that resonates with young people? Can it be used to attract uh, some talented people to this region? Does it work? Does it not, not work? How do you look at that? Maybe Talia, you are young people, so maybe you can say something about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was trying to answer uh, Martijn about the question that he posed already for a while, so... With Martijn, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm just... So an AI for good program to get talent to the region here in Eindhoven, is there something that resonates? I think it's interesting. Um, <clears throat> um, apart from the minor, we don't really get a lot of uh, other opportunities to work with this kind of, uh, of things. So I think it would attract a lot of people who might not necessarily be interested in doing the minor uh, like this, but would still be interested in exploring uh, AI. Maybe Talia, um, uh, what? Uh, so, so you, I, I guess, in the minor, you chose to do this project um, mm -hmm. over other projects. So, what what made you choose this Flower Power project? Um, we we had the so uh, I don't know if everyone is aware, but we worked with like mini companies. So our mini company had 10 members actually, and we were given three projects. Um, so, and out of those three projects we were given uh, was the, this one, the flower one. And there was also a, a butterfly one also from Naturalis and a, a one from here technologies. So um, we divided ourselves among the three projects and we were already interested in these projects. So it was either between flower or butterfly, but I was interested in seeing what uh, AI could bring to um, things like yeah, biodiversity research. I was curious to see, and that's why I personally picked uh, flower. And also because I was very interested in uh, exploring object detection. Yeah. yeah, so it was so, a, a, an, an interest and a technology uh, uh, part uh, why you chose this one, okay. Yeah. And uh, Martin, maybe can you say something about um, 
what Atos is doing in this area, or is the I know they are very active in the smart society or smart uh, city. Uh, they have a big uh, smart city program. But I'm also curious, like uh, the SDGs, is there something that is uh, on the on the radar in your company? Yeah, well, regarding the smart, regarding the smart cities, we um, we um, <clears throat> we have the interest of uh, some other uh, cities also. We we did the pilot with uh, with Eindhoven a couple of years ago. Um, unfortunately, um, there was some uh, ravaging uh, last Sunday uh, in Eindhoven. But one of our smart city applications uh, <clears throat> was developed uh, together with uh, also with the police and uh, um, Eindhoven. For example, what happens with the crowd of people? Um, so that you can predict, for example, at Stratum's Eind on a Saturday night when the pubs are open again, what will be the moment that that, that there might be some uh, some bar fights? Um, to predict it by temperature, um, color, uh, energy, etc. Uh, that's maybe an application regarding security, but um, Atos has learned a lot of a lot of it, so we can also apply it for other <clears throat> for other cities, um, and not necessarily for the uh, people, uh, the crowd of people, but also maybe later for yeah for flowers, which is uh, a better example um, biodiversity etc. So uh, we have uh, we develop it further and. <clears throat> Uh, based upon the experiences we had with uh, with the city of Eindhoven, um, we can develop it further and also uh, maybe roll it out to other cities. So it's actually a continuing uh, continuing uh, project. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for your answer, uh, Martin. Um, I think uh, I look at uh, Michiel. Is there some any interesting things in the chat? Mm -hmm. We are. No, not approaching the end of this session. Then we. No, we we there there. I don't think there's any there more questions in the chat. Any uh, questions? So if they, yeah. If there's if there's a quick question, then we have uh, we have three minutes for that before we are all thrown out of this session. So if you have a quick question for Martin, Manon, uh, Talia, uh, Talia, uh, uh, or uh, Gerard, then please uh, put them in the chat right now. There's always a little bit of lag in there. Maybe you have a question, Peter? Yeah, I would like to ask uh, a last question to Manon uh, in this case, uh, because I have a little bit of more of background about the, the, the research project that you are doing. Um, and maybe you can comment a little bit more on uh, also the software engineering part of your project. Right? So you pointed us out that you need uh, AI for your project, but can you also comment on how you involve software engineering in your project? And yeah, maybe it's important to mention that my background is in neuropsychology, so I'm not an uh, IT person. Um, so the software engineering part uh, uh, that that's done in co close collabora collaboration with the ICT uh, Institute uh, by students. Um, but we really have to think carefully, of course, about the, the data architecture uh, that um, uh, privacy in design should be arranged. It should be uh, scalable, but you also um, one, for example, to be the measurements uh, real time. So you want to process uh, a lot of data, which is coming out of those variables. Um, but you also, that is, it's then pseudo real time because you always need some time to yeah, filter artifacts and to process data and uh, to give that back to the user. Uh, but you have to make some choices uh, in that. You have to do some concessions. Um, so on, on the back end, there are a lot of choices to make. Uh, but also on the on the front end, there are a lot of choices to make uh, regarding the, the UUI you use in in a specific context. Is that an agree with um, we, we we have forty seconds for some closing comments <laughs> from Gerard. No, I just <laughs> want to give the word because it's a nice discussion. I want to give the word. So maybe then the, the closing comment is that basically you agree with Gerard that the, the AI, the machine learning model, is just a small part of your entire solution. It's a small yeah, it's a small part. AI is not the solution. It's a small part of the solution. But I think that's a nice. Uh, <laughs> that's, yeah. It's. I think it's a very nice conclusion indeed to conclude this session. Uh, I want to thank you all, Manon, Talia, for your, both your presentations and giving some insights into the work you are doing. 
Uh, Martin, I, know I also want to thank you for being here and reflecting on these presentations yeah. and uh, participating in the discussion. And uh, then I want to close the session for uh, the second session. And I hope to see you all back in the last session, which is about production ready uh, machine learning systems. So we then we dive more into the details of the software engineering part we were just uh, discussing. Mm -hmm.